Welcome to the Swim Swam Breakdown. As always, I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, coming to you today from my winter home in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, as always, we're, we are joined by Swim Swam Editor-in-Chief Braden Keith from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Senior International Reporter Loretta Race from Kentucky. Go Bengals. Loretta, yes. who day? Who day? Who day? I got the burrow action going on. Number nine, you probably can't see it, but yep. Joey B. It was a crazy football weekend, even crazier swimming weekend. Even <laughs> crazy. It was all that crazy swimming. swimming weekend. It was a good swimming weekend. <laughs> it no, it was a crazy swimming weekend. It was. There was there, there's lots to talk about. We're gonna dive right in. Obviously, off the top, world champs for 2022 have been postponed. Uh, they're mm-hmm. not gonna happen in Fukuoka, Japan in May. Braden, we we talked about it earlier in the week, but uh, why can't they just move it to another place? Why can't they just have it in May in another country? Well, first of all, I think we need to make clear that this is no longer sort of rumored or unconfirmed. It, it's clear at this point that FINA has informed federations that they don't intend to host a world championships in May of 2022 in Fukuoka, Japan. Um, and so the natural next question is, why not move it to somewhere else with with obviously Florida and their very welcoming and governor being the the obvious um, first suggestion. But the reality <laughs> is that it's not so much about the ability to host or the willingness to host. It's the willingness to pay the fee. Um, and so. The, the way these meets work, you can see from the spectators at a lot of them, there aren't many. There, there's not big TV audiences. They're not paying for these massive meets where they're flying thousands of people in from around the world and building these pools and these giant stadiums. They're not paying for that with ticket revenue like, like the Olympic trials. The U.S. Olympic trials makes money off of ticket and television revenue alone. Um, FINA World Championships generally don't, especially during a pandemic. And so the problem is that you have to find somebody and you'd have to find somebody in a very short timeline who's willing to shell out a lot of money. I guess we don't know exactly what the the money is per meet, but it's got to be a million plus dollars um, to host this on top of all of the, you know, building the facility and getting the officials and getting visa clearance and all that stuff, which is easier depending on where you go than in some places than others. Um, But as we said on Friday, and it's becoming more more and more clear the more people we talk to, that the real issue, um, Japan is not canceling the meet. So FINA can't get out of this contract super easily. Um, Japan is just making it very, very hard, almost insurmountably hard for FINA to host this meet. So that forces FINA to change, which puts FINA in a disadvantageous position with the contract. And so they'd have to work out the contract. They'd have to find um, new hosting money in a very short timeline. And I think that's the biggest problem with moving it. I mean, Uh, I was just, I was looking up just Japan's entry policy because I think that might be almost the biggest barrier is also just incoming athletes into Japan. So I think that that itself precludes, you know, people from other nations actually going into Japan to actually compete. So I think that, is more honestly the reason rather than like the strict number of cases in Japan right now. Right. So yeah. it, se- it seems to be the, the hurdles that it's going to take to import that many people into the country. I mean, and, 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 and again, we have to reiterate just like we did when we talked last week, Coleman, Japan's cases are close to the wor- lowest in the world with Omicron. Um, and with the track that we've seen in many parts of the world with Omicron, By the time the world championships come around, um, you know, the wave should have passed. We would expect the wave to have passed. Um, So this is this is becoming a cultural thing. This is a problem. Um, On the other hand, FINA knows when they host a meet in Japan that there that there's a specific culture there when they host a meet in China, when they host a meet in Russia, when they host a meet in the UK or the US, when they host a meet anywhere, they know there are cultural hurdles and they choose to host the meet there. And usually it's not a problem. Sometimes it's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Loretta, I'm curious. I know you've spoken with um, several of the 
of the national federations. Have you heard anything aside from just what they've heard? Have you heard maybe how anyone feels about this or, or, or what, you know, directions federations are going to go in after having these world champs postponed? More actually from the athletes themselves, they're bummed. Um, They actually obviously do want to compete. That's what they were gearing their training schedule for, for this, for this stretch. And so it's more the athletes are disappointed and really wanted to race. Um, so, but no one's offered up, you know, Hey, we know we were hearing this about it moving to this place or this time frame. That's still totally in the black. I mean, the best, I think the best case scenario from where we are now is that they find another host or they convince Japan to host maybe like an August world championships. To me, yeah. that's sort of the best case scenario we can hope for, for <clears throat> 2022 world championships. All of well, but I'm looking, so we, we have European championships in August. Yeah. We have world junior championships in August. We have junior yeah, like, pack championships. October, so August might be, yeah, yeah, that's what I have. October was floated around originally, I think by That's FEMA. free. That, that, yeah. that month is free for me. So <laughs> <laughs> Loretta will be in Japan in October uh, regardless, <laughs> but that was the original proposed floated date before they went to this July, January nonsense that nobody likes yeah Um, so you know maybe there's a maybe there's a chance and maybe they they do it they push off short course worlds and uh do it real or they just make kazan and budapest (laughs) like the only cities that ever host swimming meets because they're kind of like that anyway (laughs) (laughs) what what are the chances that isl hops on this and starts season four of the spring (laughs) Coleman, <laughs> if the ISL had any ability to take advantage of this, we would have seen any anything come out from ISL in the last four days. The fact that ISL couldn't come up with something that shows, oh, we're organized, we're on top of it, we're, we're handling the pandemic. The fact that they couldn't pretty much answers that question um, because like this is an opportunity for ISL. They don't even have to like announce the new season, but just to announce anything anything interesting when swimmers are looking around saying where am i going to race this year (laughs) yeah yeah. all they had to do was was say anything that captured people's attention and they couldn't do it so that's i think the answer to what isl is going to do plus they seem to prefer like pushing buttons so i think they'll (laughs) wait for the world championships to announce and then try to run their meets up till like the day before they start and then start again the day after so do you think we're going to see like a slew of americans at mayor nostrum then this year i'm wondering if that'll be the case maybe maybe usa swimming will come up with something you know replace the the canceled knoxville meet with something or push the pro swim series because the pro swim series was kind of just leading into world so maybe they'll just shift that backward a few well, months. yeah so it's like we've got des moines first week of march we got san antonio like last week into march and then we were supposed to have world trials end of april and then world champs end of may and then there's a pro swim end of june in mission viejo and then nationals first week of august and so it's like you've got racing opportunities about once a month once every five weeks or so in the, if you know, in the U S but it, that's, that's a really interesting point of like, will they go to Marinostrum? Will USA swimming put in more meets? Will they cancel trials or will that still be some weird meet where you can qualify for WUGS and also get long course raising opportunities? Uh, yeah. Yeah. USA swimming has some decisions to make. <laughs> we can skepticize all day long. Let's, let's move on. Uh, we saw a lot of exciting college swimming <laughs> highlighted by, uh, University of Florida and Auburn University dual meet where Katie Ledecky was rumored to have beaten Zane Grothy. Have we gotten any more confirmation in the comments? We got official times, but those are the comments. We've gotten emails from people who were there and nobody's got the exact times, but she definitely beat him. Um, it sounds like she was a 430 ish. We've got race video of one of the races. I don't think it's that one. The 200 so free. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think Zane even he even tweeted something out like I had yeah. the audacity to wish her luck. <laughs> yeah, you know I don't I don't know what it means for Zane, um, but for Ledecky it means a lot. Four thirty is very good. I mean, I I think she might have a little spark back. I think I think she might get close to a best time this not this summer, next summer, I guess. <laughs> 
just get the race <laughs> this summer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we we did just get sent the 200 free race video from that where you had Caleb Dressel, Katie Ledecky, Natalie Hines, Zane Gr- It was a full heat and all, all in the same heat of a 200-yard freestyle. Obviously, there were some other postgrads in there as well. Uh, Dressel was 135, Grothy was 138, Ledecky was 142, and and the video ended before Heinz finished. But I think she was like 144, 145, which is like still a very good swim, just not compared to, yeah. <laughs> to these other insane yeah. athletes. Well, isn't it the most Florida thing in the world? You know, Florida has never really been that media friendly. Isn't it the, the most Florida, University of Florida thing in the world to have all of these pros race and then not tell anybody what happened? Big, big eye roll from the media. Mm. I'm. I'm, I'm hopeful that might change under Nesty's, under Nesty's guard. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm going there soon. So we get to get some media at least, yeah. but I mean, yeah, Ledecky going 142 and 430. It's like, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also saw some pretty surprising swims from the, the actual collegiate swimmers, Karen Smith going 132 in season. I mean, that, has to bode well for him. He was also four eighteen, I think, in the yeah. five. Like it's like well, really he, he solid. Wasn't in that good mid season? He, you know, I guess he was prepping for short course worlds, which is why. But yeah. you know, does the does the one thirty two get him closer to a locked up NCAA qualifying time? Is there a chance that he he went to confirm his cut this year or uh-huh. at this meet rather than waiting for SECs? I mean, they, Florida always throws down at SECs. I mean, there's no way that he won't get it at SECs. I think, I mean, they're, they're going for their 10th straight title. It's not like, you know, he's, well, he's going to yeah, be unshaven. And but when does Florida ever go whole... 132s and dual meets? So it's... I think, I think what Florida always does might be out the window a little. It's true. I, I feel like that's just a sign that he's in a good spot. I mean, if he, if he did that in a brief, it's like, it's, that's moving. Uh, in other collegiate news, Gretchen Walsh goes a new unofficial American record in the 50 back for Virginia. She's, she also went 50 point in the hundred back. These are all, this is also in practice suits. I mean, the, like I can't even wrap my mind around how fast yeah. that is. No. I guess we're not worried about her after missing the midseason invite anymore, <laughs> which I know a lot of our readers were very concerned about her status. But I think she was there ever a reason, much. or what was the reason? She had, she had non COVID illness midseason. Okay. There's some rumors, but nothing to report. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, um, I, Virginia. We have to be clear that Virginia isn't, you know, talking Florida, Virginia isn't doing monster yardage and, and crushing their summers all the time. So they are always going to be faster in dual meets. So just because she went a 50 point in dual meet doesn't mean she's going to go 47 at NCAAs. Um, however, she might go 47 at NCAAs. <laughs> I mean, the, the Virginia women just seems like they can do no wrong. You know, they yeah. are, they are firing on all cylinders now for year, the third year in a row. And it's incredible. Um, these, I'd love to see like Gretchen Walsh face off against Maggie McNeil on a, in a 50 backstroke at NCAAs, which is like not a race that was, has ever been on anybody's radar, but all of a sudden <laughs> would you love to watch that? It'd be so I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing it helped that it was versus NC state. Who's like, you know, their ACC rival, obviously the coaches have history. They went one, two at NCAAs last year. So I'm guessing that was a pretty heated meet to begin with, uh, NC state men got the win. And then the Virginia women got the win, but I mean, still just good, good Lord. Kate Douglas just goes two Oh fives. Like it's, you know, like it's a Tuesday. (laughs) I'm so off like the yard knowledge. So it's fast. It, it sounds <laughs> it fast. <laughs> fast. That's it. That's it. Uh, fast and faster. Those are the times. <laughs> <laughs> seriously. We had, we had more fast backstroking uh, at Louisville in the form of Rye <laughs> Ouellette. I think that's how you say that. Uh, she started early. She graduated high school in December, um, started her freshman season th- this year, this, this winter, already 153 mid, uh, which broke the Louisville school record. Her best is 151 done at 2019 
done in 2019 at some point. Um, what, what do we think of this early arrival? <laughs> and then she's already just lighting it up. It's great for Louisville, uh, the Louisville women. Um, you know, I, I think, I think her, her breaking the school record already sort of answers the questions about why she'd go early because she's clearly ready for senior level competition, right? She's done a lot of things at the junior level. She's done almost everything at the junior level and she's ready for senior level competition and she can graduate college early. Good for her. Um, but this is a huge... And her huge... sister's there too, right? Doesn't she have Correct. a sister that... Okay. Yeah, Tristan. Yeah. This, this makes their medley relay so much better, her arrival and her swimming well. And, and we can't look past Liberty Williams, who broke a school record in the mile too after really not being that good at the team's midseason invite. So we're going to have to poke around and, and see that was sort of a conscious decision or if something was going on at the midseason invite. But Liberty Williams has been best times in the 500 free two dual meets in a row. Um, she was a best time of 440 against Indiana last week, and then she went 438 over the weekend. So, is, um, I mean, that's just so stellar yeah. in a you know, dual meet, you know, to me again, you know, you say, Oh, Florida has never, never not shown up for, uh, secs. This is a different era, right? Like there's everybody's living with the possibility that you catch a case the week before your conference meet and you have to be out of the pool for 10 days and you can't go to the last chance meets either. Um, and you miss your qualifying. Like that's, that's a very real possibility in this day and age. So, uh, you know, I know people like to give teams a hard time for being rested or tapered or suited at dual meets, but of all years, this, this is the year that it makes sense to me. That's a very, very good point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's like, go ahead. Every Laura. race, every race is like, could be your last race kind of thing. So I think that mentality definitely comes into play. Yeah. It's like Yoko, you only qualify once. <laughs> uh, it's yeah, I know that was terrible. Yeah, oh, so on the, on the opposite, <laughs> on the opposite end of the spectrum, we usually see Louisville not, not as sharp at their conference meet at ACCs. And then they really show up at NCAAs or they have a reputation of that. I think last year they kind of flipped the script on that one when the men won their first ever <laughs> conference title. Although but, they didn't flip the script because they also won their first NCAA relay title. So they just showed up at both. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yes, indeed. But it's interesting to now see them putting up dual meet performances like this. And so maybe that's trickling down even further. I have to go back to when two, three years ago when Mizzou announced that they were going to suit up for every dual meet and people were just like, what? Suits and dual meets? You can't do that. It's ridiculous. And now it's like, I mean, it's not really that ridiculous. Right. You know, it's like, if you have, if you know, just wear old suits and then you get the racing in. But again, like you said, in this day and age, it makes a lot more sense when there's a lot more uncertainty. Uh Let's see. We, we had some not exciting non-collegiate swimming. Michael Andrew back in the pool. He raced at a local meet in Coronado. He went, swam the 400 IM and the two fly and the hundred breasts. It's 52.9, 149 and 354, which I, to me seemed like pretty solid races. He also has a sweet pet snake now, which Ooh, I really no. want to ask him about. No. Uh, <laughs> but, but more on the races. What did you guys think of, of MA's yards times? Well, uh, it's time for America's favorite game show, which is read way too far into anything Michael Andrew does. Uh, I don't know. I, it was a local meet. He was mostly there, you know, taking pictures with with local age groupers. And it was at his home pool, which he lives across the street from. So, like, I'm I'm personally not reading too far into this. Obviously, the times weren't what you'd expect for a meet where he's going full out. Um, and, and we've come to expect him to go full out a lot, but that doesn't mean he's all, he always has to, um, you know, I think, I think the long-term thing he's got to worry about is if this becomes a pattern, you know, he didn't have a great short course worlds. He wasn't great here. The pressure is going to start to ramp up. He, you know, he needs to find somewhere to swim fast or he needs to tell us that he's how he's changed his training to, so that, our expectations change, so to speak. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of this meet, I don't know. I think he was just there more to have fun and for something to do. Oh, God, and a 4 a.m. is fun and a two fly is fun. Oh, his, God. <laughs> I think I think his parents want him to swim the 4 a.m. I think yeah. his dad really would love for him to be a 4 a.m.er. I mean, I 
think it was really brave for him to like take on those longer swims. I mean, yeah. people are always criticizing his strategy, lack thereof. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that he took him on, I thought says just a lot about him that he just loves racing. Maybe he is putting more of that USRPT, like the, you know, longer, like going for a 200 instead of like a 50 months to kind of dabble and see, you know, what kind of uh, results he's going to get in longer races. So I, I, I think that's great that he did that. Yeah. He's still experimenting, right? Like that's what they've yeah. always done. They've always experimented. Yeah. So good for him. Right. Yeah. To me, it seems like a training meet. Yeah. Like you said, Braden, definitely not going all out on this one, not going for fast times. First meet coming off of short course worlds, which was like one of his first meets after the Olympics, if What's not his first, his first meet. Yeah. So it's like, <clears throat> it's like, it's that, that it seemed fine to me. Honestly, I was like 52, 900 breasts. Like that's pretty good for, yeah, for, kinda, for where I like, think he's at now. This doesn't mean much. It, it, if we get to whatever the U.S.'s meet this summer is and he's still not swimming well, we might be able to look backwards and say this meant something. But for sure. now, I think it's just a nothing burger kind of. Yeah. But it's always fun. It's always fun to see Michael Anderson. So Yes, it is. Yep. Uh, we had another exciting 400 IM. Thomas Hailman continues his crazy streak of nags by clipping the 1314 National Age Group record in the 400 IM 351. 46 thoughts <laughs> it's it was a lot faster than michael went i i um he's getting close to his birthday so maybe we can extrapolate that this was a uh a little bit of a pre- preparation swim i don't know if i'm ready to guess that it's a taper swim but you're gonna be there so you can find out um this week you are there practice, this week practice with thomas Hailman wednesday morning can't wait for it's that happening <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's impressive how, how, how big his range has become, isn't yes, it? you know, yes, he was yes. like a sprinter as a kid. And now that he's training with Gary Taylor, he's getting a good two free, good four. I am, I'm, I'm sure we'll see a 500 free to fly to fly. Yeah. His versatility is just astonishing. I mean, that's what I, that's what my main takeaway <laughs> yeah. is. Holy hell. Yeah. It's yards, but he's kicking butt on like multiple levels. <laughs> Does that yeah. get, does his yeah. versatility? So I'm gonna I'm gonna go down a wormhole. I'll down a, a, a thought wormhole here. If he's showing all this versatility, right? That means he's not swimming a fast 1500 free just because he's only training sprint. So that implies to me that it has a higher possibility of him continuing his success as he gets older. Does does my logic make any sense? You're saying because he's sprinkling his talent over multiple events right, right. now. You're so, saying? so the fact that he's not just like hyper focused on two events, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's not just like doing mega weights to get really good <laughs> at the 50 free. Um, he's he you know he's training for the 400 IM, he's doing base work, all those things that these coaches say that a lot of coaches say you need for the long-term success. He seems to be doing a lot of those things based on his results across different events. So in my head. That means he's going to keep it up. Well, I think it's also youth. I mean, his recovery is like so much easier, you know, than like any of the older swimmers who would normally take on like five, six different events. So I think that's part of it is just the fact that he's young and his body can handle all that. And everybody ages. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this seems very, I mean, it's Michael Andrew esque, right? Like no one has broken this many nags in this age group since Michael Andrew. And uh, we saw Michael Andrew, like you said, test a lot of different things, do things differently. And he didn't just focus on one event. He's always had three, four, five focus events, and it's worked out pretty well for him so far. Mm. And so I would say definitely this is going to help Thomas, Thomas's development in the long run down the road. Coleman, did you say 341 earlier? I hope not. Yeah. 350, 351, 46. Yeah. Okay. Well, if, if he said 341, he's a liar. I'm a, yeah. Did, then I'm a liar. <laughs> um, all right. We saw some impressive swims across the pond, uh, the Pacific pond in a, f- a few different countries. <laughs> Holly Barrett, who's stuck at home or sorry, stuck outside of her home of Perth, uh, hasn't been able to get home. She hasn't been home since before the Olympics. Right. I mean, it's no, not just home, before short first world briefly in August. Okay. Cause I think they let them back in without too much hassle. After the I think they had a two week quarantine. I know that, they did. but then, yeah. Um, okay. So, th- so then she, she was home briefly and then she did ISL world cups, 
the Short Course Worlds, and now she still is not able to get into Perth, but she is in Australia. She won uh, at least one event at the South Aussie Championships. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive for someone who's just hanging out in a hotel for weeks at a time. <laughs> I think her attitude, yeah. when I was talking to her, her attitude was impressive. I mean, she's just like, you know, whatever. I'm being flexible. I'm a pro swimmer. Yeah, I have to travel. And I found a great training setup in Melbourne. She's obviously racing well. You know, I love her attitude and her response to it. I'm, I, I could see a lot of swimmers getting really, really frustrated by it. She could yeah. go home anytime, right? Like it would just crush her training for a few weeks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, it was also, she was the only Australian at, in Abu Dhabi. So it, it was just, you know, kudos to her for actually making the trek and still doing it. You know, she didn't technically have like official support. So in Australia didn't send, you know, an official roster and then Chalm- Chalmers dropped out for his shoulder. So they were going to be the only two. And then it was just Holly. So <laughs> she's kind of used to being on her own at this point. <laughs> she's got like her adopted ISL team. She probably was hanging out with the True. Brits. Yeah. <laughs> True. Until they all left. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I feel like this is just like the true, she is the true professional athlete, right? Yes. I mean, like yes. this is, this is how you carry yourself when you are a, pr- when this is your profession and you just have to get the job done. Right. I mean, right. she's been flexible. She's <laughs> taken all this crap and like, yeah. so it's just like, yep, I'm, I'm doing the job. Right. Right. Um, which is a, certainly uh, a cool <laughs> example. No back. No back. <laughs> <laughs> take notes <laughs> yeah it's a, certainly i feel like a great example for other for other swimmers athletes coming into this realm and seeing okay how can i make money how can i make this work uh we also had some fast swims in japan loretta break it down for us yeah so our flyboy, okay tomorrow honda who got silver in the 200 fly at the olympic games um the only male medalist there which is still crazy to me Um, so he was a little bit rested. He told me not entirely, who knows what that means, but he did get a 153 H in the 200 fly, which is a terrific time. Okay. Yeah. Milak is still worlds ahead of him. 150, 151, you know, obviously that's his range, but the fact that it's January and he already clocked a time that was, I think it was 10, a 10th off of what gave him silver in Tokyo. I think that that bodes very, very well and that he's fully in control of that, that race domestically. Um, and then he also did the 4 IM and he got a 412, which for him is, that's a really good time for him, um, especially again in January. So I am really, really hoping he sticks with that double. I think he's suited for it. I think it, it, it just plays to his strengths. And so I, I really hope that he continues and does the 4 IM to fly double and, you know, hopefully all the way to Paris. <laughs> Is that the is that a double at both the worlds and the Olympics? Mm. I'd have to look that up. I don't think four IM doubles two fly, does it? I mean, no, four IM's so. day one at the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, that's and at world that's champs, true. I'm pretty sure four IM's the last day. So I don't think it yeah. I don't think yeah. it's ever like overlaps. Gotcha. And then Ryosuke Irie, who freaking did okay he's 32 now so he technically does age but he really doesn't age because everybody ages you just told us that (laughs) i did whoops so he was he was 53 low in the one back and then i think he was 156 in the two back and those are literally like i swear to god you could blindfold him and like put one arm behind his back and he could still get those times like that he probably is like in like 30s 40s 50s of how many times he swum those performances which is just crazy and then Rikako EKA also swam and she got a silver in the 200 free won one uh won the 100 free but the 200 free is also one that she's kind of coming back to I think this is maybe only the second time that she's actually raced that maybe the third since her comeback you know from um the Tokyo Olympics where she focused strictly on the relays there um so I think it's boating really well again for her again not near her personal best times but Definitely someone that is on the right trajectory to do some damage in Paris, which is exciting. Um, trying to, oh yeah, and the Chil Masato, okay, who we found out breaststroker was sub 207 leading up to Tokyo, totally fizzled. I think he was like 209 for like 10th place ultimately, didn't even make the final. And I think I might have pegged him for the podium there in Tokyo. Uh, we found out that in Tokyo, he actually was battling a hernia, okay? So now that hopefully that's out of control or, um, in control out of the picture, whatever. Now he's 208, um, is what he was in the two breast long course over the weekend. So that 
that's also a pretty good time for January for him. So I liked what I saw out of Japan this weekend. <laughs> so even though they're not hosting the world champs, right. hopefully, hopefully we'll see a lot of their stars uh, in action at the Asian games later in the year. And uh, man, that's, it's a shame because like you said, they've, they've got some bright ones and it would have been really fun to see them race on home soil again. Right. Right. All right. I think that's, that's our swimming news. And now it's time for our favorite game. Let's play some sink or swim. First up today on sink or swim, David Marsh is coming back to college coaching uh, Cal assistant Chase Kreitler having his first baby. So he's going to take some time out. David Marsh is stepping in for him. My question to you, will David bring the Marsh magic to the Cal bears and lead and help lead them to a number one title at the NCAAs. If you join a team in February and your target meet is March, you should not be bringing any magic. You should be doing what the head coach says, watching, making sure swimmers are streamlining, make sure sure they're finishing to the wall. You should not be trying to institute any magic. So I am sinking Marsh magic for the Cal men. Okay, but like, come on, it's, this is David Marsh. <laughs> this isn't like some dude who just got off the coaching bus. Yeah, yeah but, but why would you think David because... Marsh in as an assistant coach? That seems like a recipe for mis- conf- culture confusion. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's why I'm thinking it, because I don't think he's he is going to rattle anything or shake anything up. I think he's literally a body on deck, and he's going to just follow the, follow the orders, and they're going to make it happen with or without him, so... I don't think he's going to like all of a sudden do Colin, anything in your crazy. Is Marsh like to just show up on deck and institute <laughs> the workout that the coach, the head coach wrote? Is that his style? Well, that's the thing. Usually he <laughs> is the head coach. Right. Hey, but yeah. But I think in this situation, it's pretty understood that like Durden <laughs> has a good thing going and Marsh isn't just going to go in there and be like, all right, here's the deal. Here's what we're doing now. I mean, Marsh Marsh is an incredibly inexperienced assistant coach. Come on. (laughs) I mean, I I don't think he's going to just go there and mess everything up. I think Dave will be like, hey, you want to take the breaststrokers today? You want to take the backstrokers today? Yeah, it's like crowd control. control. And Marsh will be like, yeah, running starts for the whole practice. (laughs) Boom, go. And maybe that'll be good. I mean... (laughs) Yeah, like, he has a presence. If Durden, I mean, if Durden tells him, like, hey, don't do this, he's not just going to do it just because he's David Marsh. <laughs> he, uh, uh, okay, you guys aren't high on David Marsh, <laughs> man. All right. <laughs> Next up, Matthew Sates is in Athens, Georgia. That is confirmed. We can put that one to rest. Uh, but now he's making his Georgia debut versus Emory. And I'm curious as to what you guys think. Will he, will he be as impressive in his first semester at Georgia as he was at the World Cup? I'm swimming it. I, I think athletes of his level can adapt more quickly than the average. You know, when we when we see whether this adaption works, it's going to be in, in small things, right? <laughs> it's going to be messing up the finish, messing up the turn. Might be something that pushes him to second instead of first or something something small like that. But he's going to be impressive. Um, I bet yeah. he comes out next week and goes one thirty-two at least in the two hundred free. Maybe yeah, I'm I, I'm swimming it also. He's such mm-hmm. a good short course swimmer that that translates pretty well into into yards. So I really don't think it's going to be that much of a transition. Um, and also, he's probably really excited to finally get over here. I mean, like screw all the commenters, including myself, who said it was never going to and he actually is a bulldog so i think he's going to take full advantage of that i i'm excited about this georgia 800 free relay all of a sudden like they were not good mid-season because of who mm. they were missing but all of a sudden they're ncaa title contenders i mean they they're mm. like 60 something you know level times yeah yeah i mean with luca jake and now matthew and yeah, throw throw anyone on the number four. Uh, yeah, that should be good. For our sakes, I hope this is a swim. Uh, next up, Ruta Melutite is at the Lithuanian training camp. Uh, do you think we're going to see her in international competition this summer? I was going to say, you know, last week I would have said yes because of Worlds only being in May and it's not a big commitment. 
world's moving and making the target Europeans now instead, I, I would presume would be the next most logical target in August. That that makes me less confident because that's a longer time that she's got to go without the big reward. That's more, you know, a longer time she's got to train. I, I can see the Federation talking her into, okay, Ruta, give it six months and let's see what happens. But when you start saying, okay, give it nine months, give it 10 months, give it till 2023 worlds, you know, that start, that can start to feel more onerous for a swimmer who isn't sure. You know, if you believe the Federation, it's, it's, they're taking it one step at a time. They're saying she's not, she, she's agreed to go to the camp that, you know, she's agreed to join the national team at the camp. That's what she's agreed to do. She hasn't agreed to swim at worlds at euros at anything. So to me, I'm still swimming it. I think she'll make it through. Um, but I would say that worlds moving would slightly reduce my confidence in that swim. Yeah, I'm thinking it. I, everything that I've read from her is that she's just swimming for the enjoyment. She wants to make sure that she's swimming for her. So I don't think that big meets are actually in her sights. I don't think she has eyes on any kind of prize. I think she is taking it day by day, practice by practice. And the fact that she's racing domestically, I think it's just, she loves racing period. So I think that's how she's feeding that hunger. But I don't think this summer she's going to, in my opinion, I don't think she's even going to go out for a particular, you know, big meet like Europeans. I think it's interesting just that I think the way we start to hear athletes talk about what they want to do is going to shift with, with all of the new focus on mental health. And we, I think, I don't know if she said it, I haven't seen it in an interview. It doesn't mean she said it, but we have to assume that she's probably been through some therapy based on the way she left the sport. And to me, um, you can read, Oh, I'm just, you know, I'm just doing it for the enjoyment of the sport. Yada, yada, yada. I can read that one of two ways, right? Like for, on the one hand, I can read that as, you know, I don't, you know, I'm just going to practice. I'm just going to train. I'm going to swim national meets because they're fun and represent my club. And, and I'm, I'm not deciding if I'm going to swim at Worlds. On the other hand, that could be a, a tool she's working on to make, take the pressure off the big meets. Basically tell herself, this is fun. This is enjoyment. I, I shouldn't feel pressure because sports are fun. I like doing sports. And if I don't, it's, you know, it's disappointing, but that doesn't mean it was the, the journey was any less fun. So it's, I think, I think we're going to see more athletes language change in the coming years um, in that way. Mm -hmm. I feel like we already have from other athletes who are kind of in her, um, in her boat of like, coming back or were you good at a really young age and then had um, a plateau or a dip period in, in their times. Um, I feel like we've seen more, at least American athletes put an emphasis on just enjoying the process, just having fun with their swimming, enjoying their sport and not as much pressure on succeeding at X level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I, I totally agree with that. I think we'll see more of it in the, in the, in the coming. And speaking of young swimmers who are really, really fast, Claire Curzan went the number two yard hundred back in the 17, 18 age group, all time 50.2. She is 0.6 behind Reagan Smith's nag of 49.66, And she's got a year and a half to break it. <laughs> Will she break it? Swim that. I mean, I think, I think we're going to come out of this thinking 49.66 Wasn't that fast. I think we're going to see 48 soon. See. Um, but you know, it, it, I, Part of the part of whether she breaks it or not is going to come down to meat selection, right? Like yeah. if she if she swims fast at meets in her own home pool. So you, there's always a chance. Um, if we saw her swim at tapered at like an NCSAs or maybe next year's winter juniors, I think there's no way it survives. I'm swimming it only because every single kid like of her generation can do it, it. Like whenever I don't think they can do something, they just go ahead and do it. And they're so incredible and so fast and so multifaceted that you have to swim it. <laughs> Imagine being Claire Curzon and going to Stanford next year, next year, and training with Reagan Smith in yeah. the backstrokes and then Tori Husk in the butterflies. Yeah. That's I mean, I can see like I don't know, I don't know if based on the timing, I would have chosen Stanford. I think it would have been hard for me to choose Stanford based on the summer they have. And I know there's reasons for why they had the summer they had, but that's what, that was the most recent information she had when she made that decision. But I can also understand why going to that training group would be very, very tempting for her. Mm -hmm. 
there's all these hotbeds around. There's like them, then there's like Florida. I mean, there's like these incredible training hotbeds within the United States. It's just, yeah, Coleman just book all these plane tickets and just go everywhere and film everything. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't like Stanford's getting Claire and uh, her teammate Charlotte, mm-hmm. who are the number one and two recruits yeah. in the class. And it's like, uh, the, the the battles between them and Virginia are going to be epic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, I think in Paris 2024, we're definitely going to have to break down the medal table by training location. You know what I mean? Like they literally could be their own country's worth of medals. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Which I feel like Stanford was in 2016, right? Yeah. With, yeah. with Maya and Simone and Katie. Yeah. All right. That's Sink or Swim. That's our show. Stay tuned every week for your week's news and swimming on the Swim Swim Breakdown.